Well, this morning I am excited, if you can't tell. God is doing some awesome things in the body of Christ. And just the level of praise and worship, the level of engagement with my brothers and sisters that are here in the body excites me every week. Every time that people faithfully show up expecting to hear from God, that excites me. Whether I'm teaching or somebody else is teaching, I, I here, give me some pom-poms because I'm going to be the chief cheerleader for whoever's ministering the word and whoever's in the house. I'm going to be the chief cheerleader. Why? Because we all need encouragement. We all need that that endorsement of our fellow brothers and sisters that gives us a little bit of a boost in the natural so that we can get to that boost in the spirit. Amen. Don't 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 think it uh, strange that this body that we have and these issues of the world will distract us from doing exactly what God has called us to do. And sometimes it's the encouragement that God puts in your mouth that reminds us of who God is in our lives and gets us back on track. So I'm excited every time. I want to pray so God can minister this message. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you and praise you. I, I give you praise, glory, and honor for what you're doing in my life, what you've shown me about my life so far, and what you're allowing me to discover each and every day. Father, I thank you that as I prepare to minister a word that... I just give it up to you. I give myself away to you so that you can think through my mind and speak through my mouth that those things that would be considered mystery, you make clear. Father, that in the end, that the body is edified, that your people are blessed, that they get the tools that they need to make it, that those who are listening for a word, a life-changing word, an answer to a prayer, Father, that you give it to them so that when they walk away, they walk away better than what they came. And, Father, we just continue to give you the glory and honor for everything that you've done. Father, I thank you for the pastors of this house, Pastor Marquita and Pastor Reggie, for even allowing me to have this space to allow you to move. Father, we just continue to praise you, worship you, give you adoration, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So, this week... Actually, it was last weekend. I heard something that disturbed me. There was a prophet on Facebook, and he was preparing to minister. And for about 45 minutes, he he was in praise and worship and all of that. And my wife was listening to it. I was doing something else. It was just on. And she ended up falling asleep, praise God, because she wasn't supposed to hear it anyway. But I was doing something else, and it was still playing. And he said something that struck me kind of odd, and I wanted to see if it strikes you kind of odd. He said, thank you, Daddy Jesus. Thank you, Daddy Jesus. And and as soon as he said it, it was like my head twitched. You know how you turn your head real fast? Because, like, you, you, you're trying to catch something just happening. You're just trying to catch it. You just turn real fast to see if you can see it. So my head twitched real quick, and I was like, that did not sound correct. <laughs> so I started to ponder a little bit. I was like, okay, God, I mean, I know that, you know, I don't want to be overly religious and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I, I just want to make sure that I'm sound in my thinking, sound in my teaching, sound in what I do. So you have to work with me on this to help me understand if, if, I'm, if I'm in error or if I'm correct. Because I don't want to judge anybody for their praise and worship and and, and their relationship with God. But he said, Daddy Jesus. And I was just trying to rationalize and I'm saying, can Jesus be my dad? (laughs) My conclusion was no. Jesus was given a specific assignment in a specific role. Right? He was born on this earth just like we were. And so because of that... He can't possibly be my dad. Now, is he Lord? Yes, he is Lord. 
does he deserve the respect that and the honor that is due the father? He does because the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit, the word tells us, are due the same honor and the same worship. And when I looked at that scripture, I said, well, wait a minute, God, that's confusing. Because if you say Jesus is due the same worship that you're due, it's, it, it's something wrong. Because Jesus's role was not a role for us to worship him. He was an example for us to follow. Right. So I started looking at the word and I said, OK, God, you're going to have to clarify this for me. And, and I understand that sometimes we take things out of context. And so how can I honor Jesus but not worship him over God the Father because God the Father is the one that is due all the worship, the honor, and the praise. He's the one that gave us every promise. Jesus only came so that we could be back in fellowship with the Father He came in as as an example for us, and he came as the living word so that he could prove the word that was spoken was true. And we do honor him by calling him Lord, because he is the king of king and the Lord of lords, right? But worship. Honor and worship are two different things. Honor and worship are two different things. And I know some religious people are going to listen to what I'm saying and they're going to think I'm crazy because you would think that I'm saying that Jesus is due less respect than God. And I'm saying, no, that's not the case. He is due all the same honor, but there is only one that we worship. And then there is one that we call upon that gives us access to the father. So I call on the name of Jesus so that I can get God's ear. So that my worship and my praise to God can be heard and received. It says Jesus was the doorway. Right. So. Let me step back into my humanness and say sometimes when people deserve honor, we put them on a pedestal and inevitably they become an idol because we start to put all of our thoughts based on what they do or what they've done. We start to put all of our faith and our hope in them and we forget the source. We forget the source. See, in the beginning, it says there was the word. And if, if you've studied the word, you understand the word is Christ. But who spoke the word? It had to be something before the beginning. Right? Because the word could not be possible if there was not somebody there to speak it. Right? It had to be somebody there to speak the word. And to start everything. I mean, I don't know about you. If I had a stopwatch, the the clock is not going to start running until somebody presses the button to start it. So somebody had to press the button to start everything. And that was God. God started everything. He pressed the button to start everything. And at the beginning, when he started everything, he started the word. Everything came into existence through the word. Through Jesus. I have to respect that. But the word is, if I if I use it in humanistic standards, the word is language. The word is something that I can read and it is a means of communication. I mean, if I want to be super spiritual, I could say. God created the word as a means to communicate with him from the beginning before he even sent it to sacrifice. It already had its assignment. See, because the word was a means to communicate. And so if the word was the means to communicate, the word was established so communication can be had. But then he had to send the word 
and give it a human body so that not only could it be the means to communicate, it could also be an example that we can learn from. And then we look in the books, and books tell stories of history. History are just accounts that we can read, that we can learn from what happened in the past so that we don't repeat the same thing over and over again. It is a case for our learning. So the word, which most stories are told in word form, whether it's spoken or whether it's written, are designed for us to read, to learn some things we should do, some things we shouldn't do. So the word was manifest in this earth before Jesus ever got here. Because the world needed a means of communication and a means to establish everything. We got to understand what Jesus' purpose was, right? So that we can give Jesus the honor that he's due as Lord. But I, I kept on being reminded of how jealous God is. And all of the examples of how people, us, are always looking for something to worship. And we always want to make what we worship physical. That's why you see fish on the back of cars with bumper stickers with sayings about do it for Jesus and all of these sayings. And we see people walking around with crosses and beads and all of these things, the rosemary and, you know, every everything that was made significant through history in relationship to God and Jesus, we idolize. The first thing that we want to do when something happens is grab that cross around our chest and say, God, please help me because we need something to touch. But it's amazing that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We cannot please God, but by our faith. So if I grab the cross and start to pray, what am I putting my faith in? I would almost be saying that I can't get to you, Lord, if I'm not holding this cross in my hand, if I don't have a point of contact. I was just thinking, I'm like, okay, guys, you're going to have to make this thing clear to me because I don't want to dishonor you in any way. And I don't want to dishonor or or make Jesus less than who he is, but I want him to be everything that he was. Everything that he was and everything that he is, because what he did for us is worthy to be respected and honored. Respected and honored, but there's a difference between honor and worship. God is awesome. Inevitably, when we, when we run into situations, we say, oh, God, or oh, Jesus. Why do we say, oh, Jesus? Jesus was our point of contact on this world. So reflexively, we say, oh, Jesus, oh, God. But there's a time where when I was a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, when I grew up, I put away foolish things. God is looking for us to mature. He's looking for us to mature in his word and not be religious. He's looking for us to be a people that stand up and believe what he said about us. To have faith in who he said we are beyond what we believe our capabilities are. And he demands honor because everywhere in the Bible, the the children of Israel went through a unique trial. They were liberated from Egypt and were promised to get to the promised land. But what should have taken only a couple of weeks took them 40 years. Why? Because Moses led them into the wilderness. And then God said, all right, Moses, now you're about to walk into the promised land. But before you get there. I need to give you 
some instructions and some guidelines so that when you get into the promised land, you'll be able to operate in it successfully. So I need you to come commune with me. Just have them chill out in the, in the wilderness for a while and come hang out with me and talk to me for a while so that I can set in motion and put in place the precepts that you need to teach them so that from this point forward, they can be the nation that I called them to be. So before they got to that point, they were they were in bondage for centuries. I reflected on my life. When did I give my life to Christ? It was probably around 28 years old. I I started going to church consistently on my own at around 24. Went off and on, off and on, just heard the word, didn't really, you know, made the confession because that's what you're supposed to do when you go to church. Um, They talk about that salvation and all of that. But there wasn't a real change in my heart because the way I felt about God before I made the confession, confession was the same way I felt about him afterwards. There wasn't a shift. Right. So I I went and went for a couple of years and then we stopped going. The world started happening. Things started happening. And then it it fell off. It became less important. I was trying to take care of other things in my own strength. And so it pulled me away from going to church on a regular basis. And so I dropped away. Then at about 20, 28, no, 29, about 29, I had a real serious life shift going on, and it, it made me, I had started a relationship with God, had made another confession uh, the previous year at a, at a conference in um, Tampa, Florida, with, with my best friend at the time, both of us went up. Uh, at a service on Sunday, and we gave our lives to Christ again. And this one was more meaningful this time. I think this time is when I really had a shift in my life, and that's probably when salvation really, truly started for me. But I was still struggling with the issues of the world. It was at the age of 30 when this final life shift started to happen that I said, Lord, for you I live and for you I die, and I am not going to walk away from you again. And I started reading the Bible for myself, still without understanding because I wasn't in the church. I wasn't learning. But at that point, there was something that started me on my path. Before I turned 31, I I found a church and joined the church, gave my life to Christ again. And I still had not had my Damascus Road experience. That's when you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you've truly turned around and God has truly touched you. So I'd have my Damascus. Well, no, I had had not had my Damascus road, but I committed myself to go to a Bible teaching, Bible believing church where I could learn the word of God. And I, I started to see people playing a role in my development at that point. And for the next Nine years, I was a part of that ministry. And at that ministry, I learned truly what my purpose is. I learned how to study the word of God and rightly divide the word of truth for myself. And I learned not to depend on what the pastor says, but to study the word for myself. And I found myself, the things that I was studying on my own, he would be talking about on Sunday. And it was like, am I ahead of the game or what? And it made me feel good because it made me understand that I truly did have a relationship with God, that it wasn't dependent on the pastor, but it was dependent on my seeking out my relationship with him. Right. But it took me 30 years to make that commitment. So for 30 years, I was playing around in the world, learning how to do things based on the way that the world did things. And I was playing around with God in a sense because I wasn't really firmly committed. I really didn't know what it took. I really wasn't trying to find out what it took. I was just trying. I was just going day by day. I was just going day by day. It was just seeds being planted, leading me on the path. But I hadn't fully committed yet. Took me 30 years to fully commit. And once I fully committed for the next nine years, 
I took every class that the ministry offered. I was in the shepherd school for pastors. I was in the uh, minister school. Um, I, I did everything that I could. I absorbed everything that I could, and I studied. God showed me how to break down scriptures for myself so that I could understand it. And I was, I, all of my friends, I was telling them all the stuff that I was discovering and trying to show them what God showed me. I was just excited. And then another life shift happened. And I moved away to another city for a short period of time, about six years, and joined another ministry and learned more about different faiths and how how things worked. And God started to boil something up on the inside of me. And I started to reflect back. Wow. This has been a 15 year journey. 16 year journey now now coming on 17 year journey but for 30 years I was steeped in the world everything that I learned about what feels good to me and what I like and what I'm interested in and and how I like to move and shake is based on worldly principles that I learned we wonder why we struggle how long did we stay in the world before we truly gave our life to Christ. And then we think after one or two years in ministry and people acknowledging us that we got the game and gone, that we're righteous and we forget about the journey that got us to where we are. And and so we start to take for granted our walk with Christ, thinking that nothing can harm us because the word says that. I started to reflect. I started to think about everything that I had been taught in the word, some things that were error and some things that weren't. And in that process, I understood and and learned what God called me to do. That's what brings me to the conclusion that when you understand what purpose is, all of a sudden life situations and circumstances don't affect you in the same way. You don't get moved when things start happening. I don't have any money to eat, but if I die, I can't fulfill God's purpose. So somebody's going to bring me something to eat or he's going to provide a way some kind of way. Because he's not going to let me fail because I'm willing to do his purpose. He's not going to let me fail in it. So no matter what the situation looks like or how bad it looks, God is not going to let me fail. I learned that every day with my wife. She is a wonderful person. And and, in looking at her, I see how stubborn and how pigheaded I can be sometimes and how immature in the word of God that I truly am, because I think that I know and I think that I have the way and I have the means. And it takes somebody who's close to you sometimes to allow you to see the true reflection in the mirror. So I thank her for that. I don't like it most of the time. But I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge it because it is a source of my growth. And it is a reminder that I still need to mature. 30 years in the world, learning how not to be a man and learning not how not to be a, a person of God, a person of integrity, a person of character, a person of um, uh, just a, a, a man or a woman of God. We, we spent all of these years going through that. And then we think after a couple of years, like 17, we have everything together. And then we wonder why something so simple comes back up to us and causes us to stumble. We wonder why, because we thought we had it all together. We thought we were God's chosen. And so because we're his chosen, we couldn't possibly make this mistake or do this dumb thing or dishonor him this way. And then I remembered about God's grace. The reason why he gave us grace in the first place is because he knew we were going to do some dumb stuff. Even after we became saved and stepped into our calling, we were going to do some dumb stuff. We were going to make some serious mistakes. But it's not the mistake that's the issue. It's how you come through. What type of integrity and character do you demonstrate in the midst of your challenge? 
when I was a child, I thought as a child and I did childish things. But when I grew up and became a man, I put away childish things. What am I saying? I'm saying that the way that I understood the relationship with God, the father, God, the son and God, the Holy Spirit was on a precursor notion that all of them deserve the same honor and the same praise with no clarification. But God is clear in what his role is. He gives us names. And if you want to know about the names of God, you need to come back next Sunday when Pastor Marquita continues to teach on the names of God. I'm not stepping into her arena. I'm, I'm letting God do what he does with her. Absolutely. Absolutely. God shows us his character through the names that we choose to call him. But we have to be careful not to worship the name. We got to be careful not to worship the name. Don't worship Elohim. Worship God and understand what Elohim means and the promise that he gives us because of that name. Jehovah Rapha. Don't worship or pray to Jehovah Rapha. Understand what Jehovah Rapha is with the promise that God gives us and make sure that we pray to God and we invoke that name because we understand the promise. We have to keep things in proper perspective because then we'll make those names idols and we'll start to pray to those names and wonder why healing never came because we missed it. We were praying Jehovah Rapha. Who is Jehovah Rapha when God only has two names? I am and love. Those are the only two things that I ever heard God really say his his name was. Now, we call him things, but you got to understand where did the names come from? It came from something that God did and people acknowledge that he is the almighty one because he showed me he was the almighty one or he was the healer because he showed me his healing. The names came from my action. But let me tell you something. If I'm standing before you now and I'm preaching, is my name Preacher? Last time I checked, my name is Dwayne. But I'm preaching. Congress, hey, Preacher, how you doing? Hey, Preacher, you gave a good word. Pastor, and there's six pastors in the room. Pastor, and six people turn around because they don't know who you're talking about. Right? I am not what I do. What I do is what I do, but I still have a name. And my name is not supposed to be exalted over anybody's name. My title is not supposed to be exalted over anybody else's title. Just because I have a title, that, that, that title comes with responsibility. What the title is supposed to represent to me is the level of responsibility and trust that God has placed on me to do his work. <laughs> But so many of us are allowing people to post us up on pedestals and almost to worship us because they see us as the conduit to God. When they don't understand, you are the conduit to God for you. I'm not the conduit to God for you. I can deliver his word to you, but you can read his word and the word will bless you because the word has an anointing all its own. Remember, Jesus is the word. So when we pick up the Bible, that's Jesus in your hand. And when you praise God and you talk to him, you're sending Jesus to him because you're sending his word to him. That's why Jesus is the go between. That's why he's the advocate, because what you're saying can't get to God, but through him. So in a natural standpoint, an easy way to understand it is that if I don't speak words, I can't get to God. Because in the beginning, everything was established. With a word, which means I can't get anything to God or from God if I don't send him a word. Now, a word is not promised to give me a result, but the word is. So if I pray to him out of my understanding, asking for everything that I think I want, but I don't apply his word to it, then I'm not guaranteed to get it. And there's a question that I need to ask. Is this going to take me closer to the purpose and plan that he's created for me? Or is it going to pull me further away? Because if it's going to take me closer, then I can have faith that I'm going to get it. 
But if it's going to pull me further away or distract me, I can probably guarantee that I won't get it. Unless he's trying to teach me a lesson. And he allows me to have it because I want it so bad. That the only way that I'm going to learn that I don't need it is for him to give it to me. And I see that it has no value. Only he has value. We have to learn who God is. The names of God tells us. But above and all else, God is everything. He's everywhere. He's everything that we need. Everything, every resource, every point of protection, every, every, everything that we can think of, God is the provider of those things. We got to understand what Jesus' role is. Jesus is the way that we can get his word to him. Jesus is Lord. When, When we invoke Lord, we need to have the right mindset in our heart to say we're honoring Jesus by calling him Lord. But we're talking to the father. We can thank Jesus for the word that he gave us, the word that we can call on to get our answers, man. We can thank him for that. We can honor him for his word and being the word. But we can only worship and praise God. What about the Holy Spirit? Jesus was clear. The Holy Spirit is due honor. It's due praise. Honor and praise based on the role and the assignment that it has. God is an orderly God. He He set us up for success if we just understand it and try not to make more of it than what it is. The Holy Spirit is constantly with us. It's our teacher and our guide. It's our answer. It's the way that he delivers the answer to us. He uses the Holy Spirit. It's what can physically touch us on this earth. I can feel the Holy Spirit. So he left us a presence here that allows us to feel him and commune with him in a physical way. But I can't see it. I can't hear it. But only in my spirit. Because his spirit talks directly to my spirit to lead God and direct me. We can't be idol worshipers in this day and age. We have to be specific and purposeful. We can't take everything that we hear on the Internet or on TV and take it as face value. Because they don't clarify when they speak. They only say stuff and it sounds good. Some of them teach. But if you're not in a church where you can hear the word of God taught line upon line and precept upon precept, there's going to be a communication gap. God said that the things of God are foolishness to those. Who are those? Those who haven't given themselves to him. Those who haven't taken time to learn his word and his ways so that they can compare what they're being told and see if it actually lines up with the word. That's why at Daystar, we don't want a group of people that are just sitting around every Sunday listening to the word. We want people that hear the word and share the word and use the word to be a blessing to themselves and to others. You might be sitting down in the sanctuary But that's just so the word can be downloaded to you. But you really anxious to get out of here so you can take that word and do something with it. That's going to be a blessing to somebody else's life. That's what we want. We want you to come to the ministry because the ministry is where the work is done. We want you to take the word out of the ministry and put it to work so that somebody's life can be changed for the better. That's what it's all about. So I don't know about you, but I'm excited. 
I'm excited for what God is doing. I'm excited because he showed me none of us are above or below reproach. We all have to be mindful and we all have to be studious in reference to the word that's taught. We have to go back and we have to look at it to get an understanding for ourselves. Anything that's taught and been taught the same way over and over and over again, it's inevitable that the facts are going to get skewed a little bit. And the original intent of the original message might not come across. See, if I hear a message and I heard it two years ago and I try to tell you that message, I'm going to it's going to lose context. It's going to lose some of the substance that was delivered to me. And if then you take that same message and you tell somebody else, it's going to lose some context. Pretty soon, it's like the little exercise we used to do in class where you start off at the beginning of class, it's about 20 people, and you whisper something in their ear, and each person repeats it, and by the time it gets to the end, it's nowhere near what it was when it started. It's the same with the way word is being taught in the church year after year, generation after generation. It's taught from the perspective of this is our doctrine. This is our belief system. But where did it come from? What's the what behind why you do what you do? What was the reason why God said what he said? What reason did God say that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit was all due the same honor, the same worship? The same respect. Why did he say that? He said that because they're all three in one. But what's not taught is that they all play a specific role and purpose. And even though they are three in one, God is still God. He was there before any of them, any of the other two existed. They didn't exist until he hit the stopwatch and he started time. That's when the spirit came and that's when the word came. The word came and then the spirit came. We have to understand what role they play so that when we pray and when we worship and when we shift the atmosphere, we know how to do it. We know how to get a word to God and we know how to pray to him, how to talk to him on a day to day basis. It's not religious. And when we do that, that's when we'll see power in our life. That's when we see the atmosphere change. That's when we see, when we praise at work, singing a little bit under our breath, our worship and all praises is shifting, shifting the atmosphere. What you saying? Oh, nothing. Shifting the atmosphere is moving. See, sometimes you have to change the atmosphere. You got to shift the atmosphere, but you got to do it according to his word. And you have to know who's doing what. Lord, I need your word today. I need you to, I need you in your word to show up real and true today. That is a true prayer. That is in line with the word. That's not worshiping Jesus. That's using the word for what it was meant to be used for. That's putting the word in this earth so it can make a change. But Lord, I thank you. God, I thank you for the word that you sent that I can use to make a change. I thank you for the ability to worship. I thank you for the ability to praise. I thank you for purpose in my life. I thank you for the opportunity to just be impactful to the body overall. I thank you for revealing purpose to me. I thank you for revealing the role that people play in my life and the role that I play in theirs. God, you are awesome. Jesus, I thank you for coming and being the word. I thank you for giving me a living testimony and a living witness to look after, to follow, to pattern myself after. And Holy Spirit, I thank you for being my teacher and my guide, my director, my ever-present help in any situation and circumstance to bring me comfort and encouragement. See, when we understand what each one does, then we can use it and it'll manifest itself in a real way. But if we try to ask the spirit of God, 
to come and deliver us from evil. That's the word's job. And if we want to worship the word, that's what goes to God. And so now you're worshiping the word. Just mute everything. Mute everything. Mute everything. You know, you know, see, anytime God is moving and doing something, there's always a distraction that comes. That was nothing but a distraction. That makes me feel good, though, because that means that what I'm saying is something that's powerful and that can change your life. I thank you, Lord, for just allowing me to, to deliver a word that is life changing. A revelation that's not really a revelation. It's just a gaining understanding so we can grow. So that we can mature and we can walk in the plan and purpose and the promises that you set out for us. I just thank you. I thank you for the space and the opportunity to deliver your word. My prayer is each person takes something away that will make their lives better. I thank you that this ministry is growing in ways that we don't even see it. See, we're growing in the spirit now, and pretty soon the spirit is going to be so big that it's going to be like a beacon of light on the hill. And when people drive by, they're going to be attracted to turn in. Amen. That he's already making a way for more people to come and hear the word of God. I just thank him and praise him for that. Amen. Remember. God is who we worship, not stuff and things. Amen. Jesus is the word, the living word that came and was sacrificed for us. He is the promise, the living promise in his word. We call upon the word because the word is what we use to change situations and circumstances. But you can't confuse the word with itself. Amen. If I talk to myself, only I'm going to hear me. So if I'm talking to the word and I'm trying to pray the word to the word, nothing is going to happen. But if I take the word and I send it to who it was meant for, which is God, the father, he'll hear the word, he'll receive it and he'll respond. And as we walk on this journey, the Holy Spirit is going to be there encouraging us, teaching us, guiding and directing us. Showing us the way that we should go so we can fulfill the plan and purpose that God created for our life. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. It's been a blessing.